Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Cybersecurity is a topic generally understood by a large portion of the public. One has only to mention a 2014 movie called The Interview and what was done to Sony Pictures' computer system, or mention Anthem and the 80 million client files stolen from its computers, or Home Depot, Target, J.P. Morgan Chase, Neiman Marcus, Michaels, eBay, Yahoo Mail, and on and on. Today we're going to talk about what you can do to protect your digital data. Our guest today is Scott Schaefer, the Chief Technologist at Blade Technologies Incorporated and the Chief Investigator for Watermark Forensic Services and Litigation Support, LLC. In addition to his work at Blade, Mr. Schaefer is a frequent speaker and contributor to St. Louis TV and radio media outlets, as well as serving as a monthly columnist of the St. Louis PC Journal, the Family Network, and Small Business Television. Today we'll be discussing what you at home or at your small business should do to protect your computer from invasion, theft, and the possible destruction of your important data. Scott Schaefer, welcome to the conversation. Oh, well, thank you. Good to see you, Lee. Uh, before we get into anything, I want to say directly to the audience, uh, I've been ill, so if I sound bad, it's the reason why I'm just out of bed. <laughs> and I'll try not to do that. Um, today's date, by the way, is uh, February 24, so that you guys, uh, in case anything comes up during the conversation, because most of you won't see this until uh, at least a week to maybe a month later. So, now, back to uh, my guest here. Um, I thought we would just start with something really simple. I've just gone to the store. I've just bought a new computer from you know, Best Buy, Micro Center, any one of these companies, had right. one built maybe. Right. Okay, now I've got uh, you know, my, my window, I'm gonna be a Windows machine. Sure. Here. Okay, so my Windows is loaded, but that's it. I have, you know, it's just right straight from the store. Right. Now, right. what do I have that I need to do from this moment when I first turn the machine on? Sure, well one thing you wanna make sure you have uh, without a doubt, is some anti-malware software. Now, this is the stuff we used to call antivirus. It's called anti-malware nowadays because malware, mal being bad, so it's bad stuff because there's a lot more bad things out there than just viruses nowadays. So you want to make sure you have something like that installed. In fact, that should be the very first program you install after installing Windows in your case. Uh, you also have to make sure that that product is not a demo that just came with the uh, computer that has like a 90-day trial. Uh, that I see that happen a lot where people well, they say, think they've got it yeah, exactly. and, then, and then all of a sudden it's after 90 days when they're not expecting it's expired. Right. Well, it's still running, but the the anti malware generally works on a on a definition pattern matching thing. So it gets updates all the time so it knows what patterns to look for to say, "Hey, that's bad." Now, if you have older definitions, sure it's going to catch the viruses and worms that came out 5 years ago, but it's not going to catch what we call things like uh, zero day attacks, things that come out today or last week that the anti-malware vendors provide you de definitions for. So first thing before you do anything, once you get Windows up and running, get some anti-malware on there. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing you want to look at, and also very critical, By is way, some sort of backup. Before we go any further, sure. what price range should people expect to pay for a good uh, anti uh, well, anti-malware? Mal yeah, man malware uh, sure. protection. Well, there's some free. Uh, for example, some come with windows that are free. Uh, if you're going to buy one, there's several options out there. Trend Micro, Micro Norton, Symantec, and all these, these types. Generally, you're going to look at under 100 bucks, and it's a subscription model, so you're going to pay that once a year, uh, continuing. And a lot, of, a lot of the vendors for home users, they have like buy one, get three free, so you can cover your whole family with uh, just one license. And well worth it. Just think about if you get caught with one of those nasty things like Crypto Locker or any of these other pieces of malware out there. Is it worth 100 bucks? Mm, for me, it would be. 
Right. In order to save all your pictures, exactly. your music, mm -hmm. whatever else you have in your hard drive. Right. And the hassle time of trying to recover, fix, uh, you know, where's my files, call the person in your family that everybody has who's the tech guy for the family, call that person, bring them in. So you're talking about potentially hours and hours of work. So you got to count that too and that 100 bucks per year. Okay. So we've now established malware for under 100 bucks yep. per year. Yep. And that's that's the very first thing. Sure, what's, that's the first what's thing. Next? next thing you want to do is get some sort of backup. Now, a lot of people in the past have used an external drive or something like that where they copy their important files off to. Now, and I, I know that's your strategy. Uh, great strategy in case the computer itself like has a hard drive failure or something like that. Poor strategy in case you have a home fire because right. it's going to take out everything. So more and more, in fact, a lot of small businesses, medium-sized, large businesses are using online-based backups where it's constantly backing up to the cloud all the time. And the good ones uh, that, are, that are out there, Carbonite's one, I use something called Crash Plan. Uh, there's several of them out there that you can get. Again, you're looking at 60, 70 bucks a year. Uh, a lot of them have unlimited plans, so it can take everything on your computer and back it up to the cloud in a secure manner end-to-end -end, so you know your data is in good shape. So, and several of the products actually let you do iterations and versioning. So you can go back 10 versions back from that Word document that you've overwritten nine times and pull that specific copy down for backup. So it's pretty sophisticated. Uh, the stuff the home user can get nowadays is really equivalent to what a business can use as far as functionality. So definitely back up. Uh, if you have to use a hard drive, that's better than nothing, an external one, just to copy things. But really take a close look at some of these online backup software and you can find something within your price range. Several of them are free up to a certain amount. So take a look at that and they run silently in the background and they constantly back up. Anytime you change a file, it shoots a copy up to the cloud. Secure, a good way to go. Now, when I looked into these online backups, uh, the first thing I noticed was, and I'm not going to get into names, sure, but I will say that there was one very prominent, well-advertised um, backup system, like mm -hmm. you were describing, that only backs up your C drive. In That's other right. words, your main hard drive on your computer. Correct. If you have external drives attached to your uh, computer, or even, I suspect, another internal drive, mm -hmm. which is not a C, right. uh, that it does not back that up. But there is another one that you had mentioned to me, right. and I went and looked at it, and it says that, yeah, I'll, I'll take all that data. I don't care how many external hard drives you got hooked into your computer. Right, you're a smart consumer. You shopped around and found something that worked for you. Uh, the, yes, there are some that'll say anything you plug into this computer, uh, external drives, whatever, uh, it backs it up. Unlimited, some accounts have, and actually I use one that's unlimited, and I have about mm, three terabytes of personal data that I back up, and that, that's a pretty good amount. Uh, but yeah, some just do your internal drives, some won't do the external drives, these sort of things. So you need to try them out. Almost every one of them have a 30-day trial a 90-day trial, something like this, so you can give it a test drive before you buy it. I'd highly encourage that because you'll find something that really works for you in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we've got our malware, mm -hmm. we've got a backup. Right. Now where do we go? Now the next thing you want to consider, there's a couple different ways we can go from here. Those are the two most important things, but the next thing we need to talk about is security. Now really, anti-malware and backup, in my mind, are parts of security uh, that you want to do. But if you have a notebook computer, for example, you may want to look at using some encryption software to en encrypt your hard disk. And what's that mean, right? Yeah. Uh, what that means is you take that hard disk and you run it through a mathematical algorithm to make the disk very, very difficult to read. So if somebody steals your computer and they don't have your key to unlock lock that encryption, they're not going to be able to get any data off Now, is this it. like, are you saying when you turn on your computer, it says password. Is it, this something different than that? It's, there are various de vendors implement in various ways. Uh, one that we use a lot is built into Windows, the, the professional versions, for example. The enterprise version of Windows has something called BitLocker, and it works really well with Microsoft. You basically turn it on, and then you don't know as a user that it's even turned on. That's just, but again, a lot of home users aren't using the professional version of Windows. You can look around and find other ones. There used to be a great product, a free product called TrueCrypt, 
but come to find out it had a security hole of its own, so I don't recommend that one <laughs> <laughs> anymore. But you can look around for encryption software. A lot of these packages that we talked about with anti-malware, a lot of them have some sort of encryption piece, like a tack-on, or one of the features that allows you to encrypt those. Not as important for a desktop computer, but certainly consider it. But for a notebook or anything mobile, it's essential. Otherwise, somebody can grab that disk, myself for example, I can have all your files in a matter of minutes. Now, what you're saying, if they're encrypted though, mm -hmm. that they're, it's all scrambled. Yeah, and in okay. theory. But, but here, 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 <laughs> here's where we, so someone like you though, mm -hmm. or the people in North Korea, or the people in China, or the people in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. who do this professionally, that cause all this mischief in the United States, sure. when they are able to extract this encrypted data, do they have the capabilities to unscramble it so they can see it in the clear? Well, if you asked me that same question a year ago, Lee, and I think you've asked anyone in computer science or, or cybersecurity, the answer would be, nope, you can't break that encryption. Now, generally, that's a rule of thumb. Encryption's tough, but we've been hearing more and more stories coming out where government agencies have back doors built into different programs and so on and so forth. And the way it works, the way encryption works in general, it uses keys. And for you to unlock that disk, you have to have the key, which maybe in your case would be a password. Mm -hmm. So if they know the password, they can get into your encrypted drive, which means what? You need to have really strong passwords on everything. I usually recommend, believe it or not, 16 character passwords. Uh, those will st they're still able to be broken, but it takes a long, 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 long time. And a lot of computing power, you're talking like NSA, strength computing to, to break a really, really strong password. So really that, in a lot of ways, is what's protecting you, is that, is that password, the encryption password, and in in using the BitLocker product, it's the same password as you use when you log into Windows. There's also a, a rescue password. So as long as I didn't have those two pieces of information, it would be well nigh impossible for me to decrypt a, a drive. Now maybe there's some state actors out there with some supercomputers that could really crunch that data and over a period of weeks or months get that information. But for me and you, we're not working for defense contractors and, and we're not you know, in the military, so we're very, very small, small targets in that regard. Now, the defense industry, uh, people who work around it, around government, they really need to look at stronger encryption, uh, multiple layers of defense. Mm -hmm. when, I was, um, when I was in the military and I was uh, working at United States Transportation Command at Scott Air Force Base, mm -hmm those computers weren't even attached by right. wire. Yep. You could only access them through satellite. Right, right, and there, there's a lot of computers now that aren't connected to anything, and they're got air gapping, because uh, you have a gap of air between your machine and the internet or any network. And those are the ones that are the most secure ones. They're not plugged up to anything. Like I tell people, uh, customers come to me and they say, I want the most secure system you can design. Well, that's easy, just unplug it from the wall. You know, that's the most secure computer in the world is the one's turned off. Anything else has, a, has some sort of threat that can come after it. And it's important for us, education. We have to know what threats are out there. And unfortunately, especially this week, we've had three major threats come into the news, and there's many more out there that we don't know about. So you have to stay informed. You have to know what's out there that, that could potentially hurt you. That brings us to the next question yeah. I'm going to ask is, What's a firewall? <laughs> What's a firewall? And what, you know, it's like the, the Microsoft is all, yeah, have you established your firewall? You know, okay, <laughs> so what's a firewall mm -hmm. and how does that help in the process that we've been describing? Sure, and, that, and that's an, a very important piece. Any, any home network, any uh, business network, any network at all that connects to the internet, you have to have a firewall between you and the internet. Now, what is it? Uh, a firewall in a house, what does that do? It stops if next door there's a fire, if you're in a townhome, for example, from spreading over into yours. So it's kind of a protective uh, barrier between you and the internet. And it sets there and all that traffic going in and out gets analyzed on a good firewall. They look at the packets, right? The little bits of data that goes back and forth. And it identifies, okay, somebody's trying to attack me. Somebody's trying to break into me. And it's not unusual for us to look at a firewall at a business and just take a look at the logs and see thousands of attacks per day that somebody's just knocking on the door, knocking on the door, see if they can get in, jiggling the handle, as we say, just trying to see. So you have to have that firewall. If it wasn't there, uh, there's been experiments done where, you've where uh, researchers have taken a computer, 
outside of a firewall, just a normal Windows computer, and started it up, and it was compromised within an hour. Uh, somebody had already been inside of it, installed malware, even with having our normal protections in place. So that's why a firewall is so necessary. Uh, it also essentially hides your your uh, identity somewhat because let's say you have a hundred computers on a network they all go out the same firewall when it comes out the side of the firewall you can't really tell on that side where it came from of the hundred computers so it, it kind of does a little substitution to help hide that so that helps you too but when you have just your your mm -hmm. little home desktop computer yep. and you have your firewall on mm -hmm. I mean, where it's coming from is pretty obvious. So right. What, what, what does that mean, where it comes from? Well, because really, surprisingly, 70% of tax come from within the network. Uh, because especially in a business, you, you have a problem where somebody comes in from the outside and they defeat all of our security, our firewall and all this, because they bring in like a USB flash drive that's infected with something. They stick it into their computer, they infect their computer, oh, wait, wait, wait. and it wait, 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 others. Pause here. Let's go back. <laughs> you were telling me an interesting story uh, right. on another day about how professionals mm -hmm. actually manage to penetrate some of these secure sure. computers. So why don't you tell that story I, right. uh, rather than me? Yeah, no, no problem. Well, security, one of the important things is know where your stance is, right? And uh, my firm, and also I have one of my partners, uh, does this exclusively, which is penetra penetration testing. And a, a function of that is not just sitting behind a computer and trying to hack a firewall and get in. One of it's social engineering. And this guy's great at it. He can walk into a bank and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, they sent me from IT, I'm to fix this, this, and this. About half the time, he gets back in the bank. Then he can put in little uh, magnetic security cameras that no one would ever see, small little guys up on the ceilings and that kind of thing and catch all that information. That's an idea of social engineering. It's not technical. You're manipulating the human, not the computer. And one way that's very easy, and this is probably the way that, if you remember Stuxnet several years ago, they got into the Iranian nuclear mm -hmm. complexes. Come to find out it was a joint U.S.-Israeli uh, operation. But the, they're, most people feel that the way they got it onto that network, because those machines are air-gapped, right? They're not plugged into a network. So somebody probably took a, an infected USB drive, took it, maybe two or three of them, threw them down in the parking lot and walked away. It's a great strategy. We've used it before. Somebody's going to be walking through and say, hey, there's a USB drive. Huh, wonder whose it is. Let me plug it in and see. And then it's all over, because then that information is on that computer and out on the network. And that's a really easy way that you know, bad guys uh, do this and good guys test this is uh, by just taking the cheapo uh, USB drives and throwing them out there. I'm really careful when I go to trade shows, for example, and a lot of times they hand out USB drives. It's happened in the past where these things have been infected, uh, you know, unbeknownst from the guy who's given them away. So use caution. You know, you don't, I don't want to uh, make people paranoid about it, uh, but just recognize it's possible. Somebody hands you a USB drive that you don't know and trust, you want to be very cautious about plugging that into your computer. Well, in this day and age, a little bit of paranoia is probably a good <laughs> thing. Yes. Because, as you said, that every single day your computer's on, mm -hmm. somebody's banging on the door trying Absolutely. to come in through the wire. Mm -hmm. And uh, that other part, you know, is pretty surprising that, you know, that professionals at a bank or other institutions mm -hmm. that are secure would be so naive mm -hmm. as to... Uh, Oh, sure. Come on yeah, back. Come on. Why? Well, he's the IT why? guy. Yeah, why not? You know? <laughs> he's the IT guy. Well, you he know, had a badge on, didn't he? Yeah, well, he probably did it, I think. Yeah, well, he's a private detective like I am, so he probably came in there all badged up, wearing a suit, and he just talked his way in. And I, I've uh, done it before in medical situations. Wear a white lab coat. You can pretty much go anywhere. Uh, and these are things. Yes, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is social engineering attacks that, that we do, so people need to be aware of that. It was really interesting at a hacker conference, uh, I think it was about a year ago. Uh, generally, these conferences have some sort of contest, like hack a company and do this and this. Generally, it's all white hat stuff, which means we're good guys, we're not actually going to steal something, and we're going to let no, somebody know where the vulnerabilities are. And one year, it was all social engineering. You couldn't use your hacking skills, per se. You had to use social engineering, and you had to get into... Um, a Fortune 500 company. So they went through and basically just started digging through the internet, finding people that worked at Coca-Cola or wherever that was maybe a mid-level person, and they just pick up the phone and call them, saying, hey, you know, I'm Lee from IT. Uh, we're, we're doing a review of our passwords, and could you give me your username and password so I can validate that it's a good password? And 
Funny, 70% of the men that they talked to gave it up. 70% of the women didn't, which I don't know what that says. <laughs> about women it. are just more suspicious, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Fairly, <laughs> but it was, a, it was very effective. And, and almost every one of them was able to gain at least uh, a foothold, a password, a username and password combination. They could get them into the network. And once we have that, really, that's the most important thing, Lee. All this other stuff we talk about, uh, you know, anti-malware and firewalls and backups, all that. Really, it's all predicated on that username, password situation. Now, we're going away from that. The plan is we're going to quit using passwords and start using other things. Like your eyeball? or Potentially. Yeah. Uh, you know, probably. The, the, the scan of your, of your iris. That's something specific. you do. Fingerprints. I mean, they're already using fingerprint yeah. in, uh, in a lot of technology. Right. That's biometric technology. And they can do a lot with it with your voice. Face, facial recognition is becoming more and more frequent. So we're going to get into a situation where we use multi-factor authentication. And what's that mean? That's You have to have two of three things. Something you have, something you know, and something you are. Okay, so for example, a combination would be a password, something you know, and a fingerprint scan, something you are. Both of those have to match, and then you're into the system. So you're going to see that more and more. I, you know, I use it. Most, a lot of laptops have the little p fingerprint scanner, and it's good practice uh, to go ahead and enable that, register your fingerprints. There's a process, a wizard that walks you through it generally. And then that way, you've got really good uh, security. Nobody can't just grab your password and get into your computer. They got to have your finger too. So it's one of those things that helps. Well, in some of those movies, <laughs> they just grab someone's finger. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's possible. I mean, there's been some studies actually uh, where people have done biometric studies on cadaver fingers. And, you know, for a very long time after post death, they can scan those fingerprints and get into systems. So. Huh. Interesting. Now, you, uh, you had mentioned something called CryptoLocker. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, on Sunday the 22nd in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, it says a Chicago, uh, a, a suburban Chicago police department paid a hacker $500 mm -hmm. ransom. This is the police. Yep. To restore access to data on a police computer that the hacker disabled through the use of increasingly popular virus. The police department, uh, we won't go into where, <laughs> uh, hit in January uh, using CryptoWare virus, which mm -hmm. encrypted some files on the department computer without, le and so they can't get in without the key. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, is this happen a lot? We've had uh, more than... This is the police now we're yeah. talking about. We, we've had several, let's put it this way, we've had several customers that we work with that have been attacked by this. And, and what it does... It essentially gets onto your computer somehow, some way. You know, it defeats your firewall, defeats your anti-malware, whatever happens, it gets on your computer. Then in the background, it does a scan and it looks for the My Documents directory and any sort of Word documents, Excel documents, anything like that, and it encrypts them. And remember, we're talking about encryption. You got to have the key, right, to unlock it. So it encrypts all those files, and then it pops up generally a window saying, "Hey, I've got all your files. You have 48 hours to send me X amount of money." via some sort of anonymous paying system, or you'll never have your files again. They use a type of encryption that would be really impossible to crack. I mean, it's very, very secure. It's not worth it. So what the police in this case, and what we've had customers do too, they weigh it, say, okay, do we want to have, for example, Blade Technologies that come, come in, in here. and spend $1,000 yeah. with you. Or pay, or pay $500, $500 to the hacker. But what happens, do they actually release or you just pay them the $500 and they go, ha ha. Every one of the cases we've been involved with, they've released it. In fact, Lee, they have tech support. You can call them up if you're having a problem. <laughs> <laughs> now, these hackers, they are actually physically outside of the United States, aren't they? We where, don't know where, for sure. Where the police can't get at them. Yeah, generally, we don't know for sure where they're coming from. They do a good job covering their tracks. But most of the time, it looks like it's coming from Eastern Europe. Uh, those sort of places, and uh, you know that's the thing. Uh, you know, people get a hold of it. It's all about greed, uh, and this is a perfect example. Uh, they're good. They are really bald faced about it. They're not trying to steal your credit card information. They just want cash, and it works out great. So you're looking at it's the police department. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's, it's <laughs> the Godfather all over. It's just another. You need protection. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then what's the problem? You know, the police department. I'm sure we're in, was in a position that you know they needed the files. Uh, so they basically paid a criminal uh, a ransom to, mm -hmm. to get out of it. Now, remember we talked about backups? If you had a backup, you could just tell these uh, hackers to go away, restore your backup, and you're fine. 
Yeah. You know, that's the thing. We got like just under five minutes left here. Mm -hmm. So two things. One, I want you to talk about anything that we haven't covered that you think is important for the audience to hear. Um, but I, before we do that, I wanted to ask you, so when I have my external drive attached, right. is that still clean or has that now been attacked as well? Depends on the, on the flavor of the crypto locker. Uh, some will look at the external drives. And I would feel if I had to, you put me on the spot and said, what do you think? I would say, yes, it would probably get encrypted. They're sophisticated enough to be able to find those files on any attached uh, piece of equipment. One more reason to go away from the old fashioned, you know, external hard drive backup to use something like a cloud backup or these sort of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. anything else that we haven't talked about that you're the expert, you tell me what we've missed. <laughs> well, I tell you what, the, the past week there's been a lot of security stories. We, we found that the uh, supposedly something called the Equation Group, which is more than likely the NSA, all, all, uh, all uh, information points to that, has infected the firmware on hard disks on, around the world. What the heck does that mean? Firmware is the software that runs hardware, okay? So it's before the operating system starts, like when you first start up your PC, it says, you know, BIOS loading, count and memory. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. So even before- so you can't we, even get to your stuff be, until you exactly. get past that. So, so hidden and so well done, very, very well done, where that the only way to be absolutely sure to get rid of it is to take your hard drive and shred it. There's, even if you format it, even if you do anything, it could still live inside that firmware. So that's come out. We've also had, in the last week, uh, Lenovo uh, was shipping essentially a piece of malware with their systems. It wasn't really malware, but it ended up having a security hole that allowed me to decrypt any of your traffic back and forth. And probably a third thing, just in the past week, is there's been a study that shows the US and UK intelligence services have broke into a uh, Dutch manufacturer of the little SIM cards that go into our uh, phones, right? And these guys are like the biggest suppliers of SIM. They do it to AT&T and so on and so forth. So that's that little chip, right? That's the piece that encrypts our information when we're talking from our phone to the, to the recipient. Uh, remember, it's a key system. So now we have a, a, back door. a back door in to be able to listen to our conversation, decrypt our data. And a lot of information shows these types, especially the equation group stuff where they are in the hard drive. They've been doing this for 10 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. So it's been around for a long time. So you know, we're getting to a point now, we, we really have to look, take a hard look at our privacy. And I know too many people feel that, oh, I'm being watched anyway, and I'm not doing anything wrong, so I'm okay. And, and we were talking off air before we, we started today. Uh, you know, I equate privacy to liberty to, to a certain extent. You know, there's something there, you know, as far as, you know, being private helps us to exercise our freedom of speech. You should be secure in so your papers and personal. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's one of those right things there. that I, I think, think that's we, Fourth Amendment stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think by just saying, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, I know I'm being watched. I, I think, I think participates in the problem. It doesn't fix the problem. I think more people need to ask questions like this. I'm not telling people to go full Snowden and start disclosing confidential information. That's not what we're talking about. But we need to be more aware of what information is being collected, uh, by whom, and what are they using it for. Uh, some of that information is easily to, to be able to get. A lot of times we install a piece of software and we just keep clicking those buttons, right? And it could have something in it. So just be aware of where your information is going. Thank you very much for being, that's, this is like one of the quickest half hours <laughs> that I can remember. Thank you very much for being with My us pleasure. today. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Uh, and I've been speaking with uh, Scott Shaver. He's from uh, Blade Technologies, giving you some very excellent advice about what you should do to protect your computer. Believe me, I, who have a lot of protection, have gotten hit by these people before in the past, and I've put more protection on. This is being uploaded to YouTube. Go take a look. That way you can show it to your friends. We'll see you next time. Thanks.